It had been a long stormy night here on the Sea of Galilee. And in the early morning's light, four fishermen had beached their two fishing vessels with nothing to show for hours of toil. They dragged several casting nets from their boats and began throwing them and pulling them through the water to clear the nets of debris. One of the bearded, deeply tanned men cut quite an imposing figure. His name was Peter, the leader of the group. He beckoned to some of his hired men and pointed out the spots in the nets that needed mending. He was not in a good mood. Peter didn't take failure lightly. Engrossed in cleaning out the boats, he didn't notice at first that a large crowd was starting to gather on the shore. Suddenly he looked up and hundreds of people were standing there. And in the middle of them all, a man. A man he thought he recognized. The man began to speak. Yes, it was the teacher from Nazareth. Peter was about to have an extraordinary encounter with Jesus, an encounter that would turn his life upside down. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. For many people, it seems that religion is fine. Fine for the weak, that is. For those who can't get around on their own. Some people just need the comfort and reassurance of faith. But the strong, the secure, and the able-bodied, well, they seem to be doing quite well on their own. Thank you very much. Religion for them just seems to be something that slows you down. Today, we'll meet a dynamic, self-sufficient individual who had to face the question, do you have to become weak to become a Christian? That individual was Peter the fisherman. We meet him here on this shore, the shores of this lake, the Sea of Galilee, after a long, unsuccessful night of fishing. Jesus arrived on the scene and began teaching the crowd. Peter listened as he worked on his boat. He liked Jesus from the moment they met. He was so different from the scribes and priests who were always nitpicking about some detail of the law. In fact, he was different from almost all the religious people that Peter knew. He seemed to belong out here in the, in the great outdoors. There was a sense of power in his bearing that matched the elements. The crowd kept thickening on the beach. People in the back tried to push their way closer and Jesus found himself stepping back into the water so he turned and asked Peter if he could get into his boat. The fisherman was happy to oblige. After Jesus had finished his talk, he suggested something quite unexpected. Let's go fishing. He asked Peter to take the boat out into the, the deep and let the nets down. Peter looked at Jesus in surprise. And then he explained, we worked here on the Sea of Galilee all night and we worked hard and we caught nothing. You see, the prime hours of fishing were always at night. No one caught much in broad daylight. But Peter caught the earnest look in Jesus' eyes and he said, but at your bidding, I will let down the nets. As the fisherman checked his nets before pointing the bow of his vessel out toward the middle of the lake, as he sat there in the stern with the cool wind off the water blowing through his beard, he didn't realize that he was about to sail out to meet his destiny. This was to be a turning point in his life. Jesus planned to ask Peter to be his full-time disciple, to leave his fishing business and follow him on the road. And Peter presented a special problem to Jesus. It wasn't that Peter couldn't make decisions. Peter usually made them instantly. Let the chips fall where they may. It wasn't that Peter shrank from challenges. He thrived on them. He would butt heads with any man, take on any obstacle. The problem was that Jesus' call consisted of two words, follow me. And Peter was anything but a follower. Peter was a born leader, a confident man, a provider, he made good in the fishing business. He didn't need anybody to hold his hand. Peter's temperament stands out clearly in his later contacts with Jesus. 
He wanted to be a player in the game. If Jesus was out walking on the water, then Peter wanted to walk on the water as well. If Jesus asked for a declaration of faith, then Peter would be the first to give it. Once on a mountaintop not very far from here, Jesus was transfigured before Peter and two other disciples. He appeared in awesome divine glory along with Moses and Elijah. What was Peter's response? It's great to be here, he said. Let's build three temples, one for each of you. On another occasion, when Jesus spoke of the sufferings that awaited him, Peter took him aside and tried to straighten him out. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 22, we read about it. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter embodied the strong, self-confident man. It wasn't that he didn't admire and love Jesus. He just wasn't a follower. Weak people, needy people followed. They followed Jesus easily, it seemed. The lame were healed, the blind were given sight, the paralyzed lifted to their feet. These individuals naturally wanted to follow the powerful, miracle-working Christ. But what about Peter? As he sailed out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee, he was about to face an important question. Do you have to become weak to become a follower of Christ? Many people today face a challenge similar to Peter. Strong, self-sufficient individuals wonder what religion has in it for them. They see people whose lives are falling apart collapse into God's arms. They see the hurting and the broken come for restoration. They hear calls to bring their miserable lives to Jesus, to lay their burdens down at the foot of the cross. That's fine for some, but they don't feel particularly burdened or broken. So they conclude religion really isn't for them. Many men have this kind of reaction. They see themselves above all as providers. They want to take care of business. They want to be strong. And then someone comes along and makes an appeal to come to Jesus with all your troubles. Well, that seems passive, submissive. It seems like giving up. They can't imagine that the object of life is to have someone else take care of you. Do you have to become weak in order to become a Christian? That's the question strong, secure people face today. And it's a question Peter faced as he sailed out on the Sea of Galilee. How would Jesus make a disciple out of someone who was anything but a follower? Well, let's find out. Peter let down the sail as his boat reached the deep part of the lake. And then just as Jesus had instructed, he threw out the net. It sank into the water and almost immediately began to fill with fish. It seemed like a whole school of fish. Peter couldn't believe his eyes. He and his brother Andrew started to haul in the net, but it was too heavy. The net began ripping. They had to call over their partners in another boat to help them raise the catch. Peter filled the other boat, but the net was still bulging. They dumped fish into their own boat until it actually began to sink. Now, Peter was really overwhelmed. He knew this lake like the palm of his hand. He knew fishing, and there was no way in the world you could make a catch like this in broad daylight. There'd been nothing at this spot the previous night, but here this teacher had produced the catch of the year with one little suggestion. This was an extraordinary man, a great man. Impulsive Peter threw himself down at Jesus' feet and said the first thing that popped into his head, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus changed his life with one sentence. From now on, Peter, you'll catch men. That was the call. That was the appeal. How did Jesus make a disciple out of somebody who was anything but a follower? He showed him how much more he could do. He joined Peter to himself and showed Peter that together, Christ and Peter could do much more than Peter could do alone. He fired his imagination. He opened up possibilities. Two boatloads of fish did that. That's why Peter responded when Christ said, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Luke tells us that after he brought his vessels to shore, Peter left everything and followed Jesus. Christ has a special message for the strong. 
follow me and you can do more than you ever dreamed possible. You can do more, not less. Listen to the benediction that Paul, another very strong individual, wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory. Two boats filled with fish were immeasurably more than Peter could have imagined. He was overwhelmed by the power and nobility of Christ. And so he set out on the road with him. But that was just the beginning of the story. That was just the beginning of a series of adventures that would have changed Peter's life. This strong, self-sufficient individual had been attracted to Christ because of a big challenge, becoming a fisher of men. But now he had a very important lesson to learn, and it would take him a long time to learn it. Peter had to become strong in a different way. He had to become bold and courageous in a different way. It wasn't enough simply to join forces with Christ. The power of Christ had to get inside him some way. That power, that supernatural strength, that spiritual strength did get into Peter's heart and soul. Christ did transform him, although we don't see it clearly until after Christ goes back to heaven. Let me give you a few examples of that transformation, that different kind of strength. Strong, secure people tend to say whatever's on their minds without fretting. They don't think about the consequences. Peter was certainly that way, but he was also very impulsive and tended to get his foot caught in his mouth a lot. We see that throughout the Gospels. But let's take a look at Peter later in the book of Acts here in Jerusalem. Once he was brought before a Jewish council for speaking about Jesus at the temple. He'd just been in prison for doing that, and now he was at it again. The Jewish officials put on their most indignant faces. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, they thundered. The officials were sure they could intimidate this former fisherman who stood before them. After all, this was Peter, who when Jesus was arrested, had run away with the other disciples. At Jesus' trial, he denied to a servant that he even knew Jesus. They just needed to get Peter's impulses going in the right direction. But instead of apologizing and promising not to speak again, Peter replied calmly, we ought to obey God rather than men. And he went on to remind them that they had condemned Jesus to death on a cross and that God had raised him from the dead and exalted him to heaven. Peter ended this assertion, we are witnesses of these things. Acts 5 verse 32. The Jewish officials didn't quite know what to do. This was a different man standing before them. This was a different kind of strength, a steadier resolve. In the end, they gave Peter and his companions another warning. They had them beaten and sent them on their way. Peter rejoiced that he could suffer shame in Christ's name. Yes, something had happened to that fisherman. Before when Peter spoke, he had to take his foot out of his mouth. Now when Peter spoke, thousands were converted. Peter had displayed a certain kind of courage before. When Jesus warned that his disciples would forsake him in the hour of trial, Peter answered back in Matthew 26 verses 33 and 35, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And Peter meant those words. He was willing to die like a man for the cause of Christ. He was willing to fight like a man. When the soldiers arrived in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter drew his sword. As they stepped forward to arrest Jesus, he lunged forward and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus had to tell him to put his weapon away. But then when Jesus allowed himself to be dragged away, Peter's resolve vanished. He found himself running for his life in the night along with the other disciples. Peter was prepared to fight for Jesus, but he wasn't prepared to be mocked because of Jesus. That same night, a servant girl thought she recognized Peter and taunted him as one of Jesus' Galilean followers. Others joined in. Peter swore angrily, I don't know the man. But before he knew it, he denied the one who'd meant everything to him. 
Peter thought he would be the one to stand strong in the worst of times, but he buckled under pressure like everyone else. Later, however, in the book of Acts, we find the same man showing us a very different kind of courage. He was in prison again for preaching openly in the name of Christ. King Herod had arrested him this time. He intended to have Peter executed to score points with some of his Jewish subjects. But in the middle of the night, an angel came to rescue Peter. He appeared in the cell where the apostle was chained between two soldiers. He was going to lead him out to safety. The chains would fall off and the prison doors would open. But here's a remarkable detail that stands out in the narrative. The book of Acts tells us that the angel had to wake Peter up. He had to strike him on the side and say, quick, get up. Now think about that. Here's a man who is going to come up for trial the next day, and the trial is fixed. He's probably going to be condemned to death. Any normal person would be pacing back and forth in that cell, worrying, fretting, sweating it out. But Peter was sound asleep. Peter made courageous stands for Christ throughout the book of Acts. But this one detail speaks volumes about the courage that entered his heart. It contrasts with the bravado of a man who swears allegiance to Christ one minute and denies knowing him the next. In that dungeon cell, Peter had a calm assurance that he was in God's hands, that he was doing God's work. God was responsible for the ultimate outcome. To put it in a nutshell, Peter was no longer trying to be brave on his own. He was no longer trying to look courageous. He just was. So we've seen these contrasts between Peter before and Peter after. We've seen the difference between a man who thought he was strong and a man who really did find inner strength. What made the difference? What happened to Peter? To understand, let's look at his failure. After he denied Christ, Peter had to take a good hard look at himself. Peter was a doer, a mover, a shaker, a very self-confident man. He wasn't used to taking good hard looks at himself, but now he had to face his weaknesses, his vulnerability. And this finally enabled him to open up to the kind of strength that Christ has to offer. It enabled him to accept the need of a deeper kind of courage. The love of Christ broke through. It won him over. And so when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, Peter received it wholeheartedly. He was ready. Pride no longer put up barriers. He wasn't posturing. He wasn't pretending to be the self-sufficient one any longer. He was pleading as the one in need. We get a glimpse of what Peter learned in his first letter. Listen to what he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. That's it, friend. This admonition is really a picture of Peter's new life. He wasn't just trying hard on his own. He was aware of God's gift, of God's grace working inside of him. When he spoke, it wasn't just his own eloquence that counted. It was God's words expressed through him. When he served, he served with the strength that God provided. Did Peter become a weak person after his conversion? Not at all. He found a more resilient strength. He found a deeper courage. But did the strong person have to come to understand his weakness? Certainly, yes. He had to see that he couldn't do it on his own. He had to see that to stand strong, you have to stand with Christ. Before. Peter's courage was a little like tin armor, a bit brittle with a hollow echo inside. After, Peter's courage was like tempered steel. Do you have to become weak to become a Christian? No, but you have to acknowledge your weakness in order to truly become strong. The most powerful personality in history invites you to share in his life. 
He wants to pour a more resilient strength inside of you, a deeper courage inside of you. The most powerful and most loving personality in history wants to change you from the inside out. But you have to come to Him acknowledging your need, without posturing, without pretensions. You have to come just as you are. Let's join Peter right now as we respond to Christ's great call, follow me. Let's join Peter right now as we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ into the world to show us what abundant life can really be like. Thank you for showing us what real inner strength is all about. We want to become all that you intend us to be, but we can't do it on our own. We become proud and brittle just relying on our own strength. We break. So we come to you acknowledging that even in our strength, there is weakness. We need your qualities in our lives. We need your gifts and your grace. We need to start from the point of your forgiveness and acceptance. Take our lives right now and mold us into your image. We ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior, Amen. From the Sea of Galilee, I trust you've been inspired and encouraged by our series, The Touch of Freedom. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <laughs>